We're here in Geneva, in Switzerland, at the Overcoming Inequalities in a Fractured World Conference hosted by the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. I had the pleasure to speak with some of the speakers. Enjoy this mini-series about inequalities. Okay, so I am François Bourguignon, and I am uh, an emeritus professor of economics at the Paris School of Economics. Thank you so much for joining me. You are one of the keynote speakers here at the conference. What is the key message of your presentation? The presentation was really about uh, inequality uh, today or in the recent past in uh, the world uh, overall and in some countries and about uh, what we may expect for the future. And uh, my view is uh, that when we look at the past, we have gone through a very favorable period where global inequality has gone down, practically because developing countries have been able to grow faster than advanced economies. This being true not only of those big emerging countries like China, like uh, India, but also in the 2000s, uh, in the case of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, Latin America. In countries, the evolution is really uh, very heterogeneous, but uh, except for a few countries like the United States, we don't observe uh, a rising trend of inequality over a very long period, where, where there has been an increase in inequality tended to stabilize after a while. So this is for the past, and I would say that uh, if we were to stop the world in uh, 2015, we could say that uh, despite the crisis in 2008, things are more or less uh, favorable. But now if we look at the future, I was uh, uh, expressing uh, some pessimism about the future for two reasons. The first reason is that I believe that <coughs> the uh, region of the world where we find most poor people today, which is Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, is also a region where demographic growth is extremely quick. Uh, this is a region where the population grows at a rate of 3% a year. We know that within the next 30 years, there will be 1 billion more African people. And uh, basically, I have doubt about the engine of growth of uh, those economies, I believe that uh, they rely uh, almost essentially on the export of commodities, at least the bulk of them, not every of them, but the bulk of them. And uh, because of that, they cannot grow much faster than uh, the growth rate of the whole world. And because the rate of growth of the population is very high, this means that per capita, they will not grow very fast. 1% on average over the long run would be more or less the order of magnitude. But this is less than the long run growth rate in developed countries. This is much less than the growth rate in emerging countries, which means that the poorest part of the world will uh, lag behind the rest of the world, which will contribute to an increase in inequality. So the favorable evolution of the global income distribution or welfare distribution that we have observed in the last 15 or 20 years, from my point of view, might not uh, continue because of this uh, sub-Saharan factor. And my second uh, uh, reason why I am a bit, a bit pessimistic on uh, the future is that I believe that we are uh, already engaged in this uh, a technical revolution, which is automation, which is artificial intelligence, uh, which has already uh, uh, shocked the labor market. We observe, for example, that in many countries there is a, a polarization of the labor market with more people with high uh, uh, salaries and more people with low salaries and less people at the middle. This will continue. The uh, technical revolution will have an impact on uh, the labor market. It will also have an impact on 
the overall distribution of income because the surplus generated by this uh, technical change will go mostly to the owners of uh, the new machines, the robots, or the owners of the algorithm that will be responsible for artificial intelligence. So because of that, I have the feeling that in the future, we are about to witness a, a big increase in inequality during all the transition period where we will be feeling the direct impact of the technical revolution, but it will take time before the profit that uh, this uh, revolution will bring in terms of higher productivity for uh, people before this is uh, being recycled in the economy and everybody can benefit from it, it will take a long time. So the transition period may be a very difficult period. And we should try to prepare to address the issues that will arise during that period. Uh, the issues being, uh, how uh, do we uh, limit uh, the increase in inequality? What do we do to provide employment to people who will have lost employment? Uh, and these, are, these will be very difficult issues. Has poverty declined around the world? There is no doubt about the fact that poverty has regressed, has diminished in the world. And it has diminished in two ways. It has diminished in terms of the proportion of people below some uh, poverty uh, limit, poverty line. There are various poverty lines, but whatever the poverty line you look at, it is true that there are less, uh, the proportion of people below the poverty line is smaller. But what is, this has been go going on for quite some time, but uh, for some time the proportion was going down, but because the population is increasing, the number of poor was increasing. This is a big difference over the last uh, 15 or 20 years, in particular in sub-Saharan Africa, which is the fact that economic progress has been able to dominate uh, uh, demographic growth. And uh, my answer to your question is no. There is less poor, uh, poor, poor people today in the world than it was the case before. Why should we care about inequality if poverty is on the decline and quality of life improves? Some people say, why are you interested by inequality? As long as there is less poor people, shouldn't we be happy with that? And uh, this is a good argument. But if we uh, believe or if we have the proof that because there is more inequality, because very rich people are getting a higher share of the total income, because of that they are slowing down the uh, progress of the poor people, then we are interested in inequality. Because we say, okay, it is good that the number of poor people goes down, but it could go much faster down if we are able to bring back part of the income of the very rich to the poor people. So this is really the big issue behind inequality. But it is not clear that it is so easy. You cannot uh, tell people, okay, I will take something from you and I will give, in, give it to the poor people. If you want to do that, you have to introduce taxes. But if you're introducing taxes and if your tax is too high, then the rich people in the country will say, no, here the taxes are too high. I'm leaving. I'm going somewhere else. We cannot believe that uh, redistributing and taking one dollar or one peso or one uh, uh, CFA franc from rich people and give it back to the poor people uh, will uh, always do the trick. We are losing money in the process. When we take one dollar from the top, when we get to the bottom, we don't have a dollar. So there is a leakage in the system due to the fact that the economic efficiency or the efficacy of the economic system is being affected by this kind of distribution. You have written also a book about inequality and globalization, right? The book was uh, entitled The Globalization of Inequality. And uh, it was really about uh, the fact that uh, inequality was becoming a global issue uh, for a long time, 
people were saying, okay, we don't care about global inequality. Inequality that matters is inequality that does exist in one country. And the people in uh, Chad uh, will not be considering people in uh, Niger, the, their neighbor. Uh, this is another population, they don't care. But because the world has, becoming, has become more and more integrated, this is not true anymore. People have the uh, TV, they can watch TV, they look at the way in which people in the rest of the world can live. They look at the uh, TV series coming from uh, the United States or coming from other countries. And they say, how come I am uh, so uh, low in terms of purchasing power when I'm comparing myself to those people? And in the other uh, camp, to some extent, people in uh, rich countries say, how come those people living in uh, Mali or uh, living in uh, Tanzania are so poor? Uh, there is something wrong in that. So from that point of view, inequality is who has become a global issue. And uh, uh, we would like to uh, make sure that over time, poor people become relatively less poor with respect to the others. And uh, this is the reason why uh, uh, inequality has become a global issue. But at the same time, the book was also about what is the impact of globalization on inequality. And what is the impact of globalization on inequality? We could think that uh, uh, the impact on uh, uh, developed countries, uh, the issue basically of globalization is really about the relationship between Asia and uh, uh, the West. Basically because the big thing about globalization has been the uh, surge of uh, Chinese manufacturing in the world and the fact that a lot of manufacturing industry has left the uh, advanced economies to go to China. And because of that, jobs were lost. Uh, some uh, uh, small cities in the US, in Europe, were basically deindustrialized. So a lot of uh, local uh, problems. Uh, and uh, uh, some workers uh, basically uh, lost their job. All the wages went down. So globalization, without any doubt, had an impact on the labor market in uh, uh, formerly uh, industrialized countries. And of course, it was a very good thing for the Chinese. And it was a very good thing for all the people working with the Chinese, with the Vietnamese, with the, all this part of the world, did very well. And in terms of world inequality, world inequality was reduced because of that. But what is uh, uh, the, the problem of that is uh, the fact that uh, uh, in uh, advanced economies, uh, some uh, resentment uh, uh, appeared uh, against this uh, globalization, which was really reducing the standard of living of some people. And this is a very difficult issue because workers or some workers were affected by this uh, competition coming from Asia. But at the same time, those goods which were uh, produced in Asia were much cheaper. So many people could buy goods at a much cheaper price, which they could not buy before. So in those advanced countries, you had a kind of uh, dilemma between workers who were unhappy and consumers who were happy. In some cases, both, some people were both consumers and workers, but this was a very, very difficult issue. But today, uh, what we observe is, together with technical change, uh, the impact of uh, globalization plus technical change in advanced economies has been uh, uh, rather uh, bad uh, for many people, in particular people who are not living in metropolitan areas, who are not living in the most dynamic part of those uh, countries. And what we see today with, uh, and this was something I talked about this morning, and something I talked about in that book, I said, because of that, we will see that there will be a pressure on uh, the political system, which will come from those people who are uh, deeply unsatisfied and who are against the system because they consider that the establishment, which has permitted globalization, 
which has encouraged the globalization, uh, has been uh, 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 going against them, and something will happen. And I was predicting something like uh, the Trump uh, uh, election, except for the fact that I thought that uh, it would not be a Trump. Uh, in terms of the uh, American election, I saw that it would be a Sanders. Uh, so from that point of view, I was wrong. But uh, I was right in the sense that, yes, something has happened politically. And uh, this is also in a, uh, somewhere in Italy. This is somewhere in, a, in, a, in, in the Brexit. There is something of this type. We have the same kind of mechanism, which is behind the... The, uh, the the scene, and uh, uh, because of that, I think that we are uh, we are living uh, difficult times. We are facing some challenges here in the developing countries, but at the same time, people are accusing us of contributing to the inequality. For example, by paying very little for raw materials coming from Africa. What is your opinion? Okay, that's very difficult to say because when you look at the last. A cycle in terms of community prices. It was not so much due to uh, uh, Western countries and advanced, uh, advanced economies. It was very much due to China. The fact that China was booming, literally, growing at 10% a year, the needs of China in terms of uh, commodities was absolutely enormous. And uh, China directly made uh, deals with uh, uh, all those countries in Africa telling them, uh, okay, uh, uh, if you uh, uh, provide me with a continuous uh, uh, supply of uh, those commodities, then uh, uh, we are in business, I will help you in uh, doing uh, constructing infrastructure, etc. So from that point of view, I don't think that uh, really there was, a, that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa was uh, in any case uh, 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 discriminated against in terms of prices. Uh, at least this was the last uh, big uh, cycle in commodities. Uh, but, you know, it's very difficult to say that uh, there is a right price for those commodities. Um, okay, I mean, uh, when the price of oil, the price of gas, the price of copper, the price of cocoa, the price of cotton goes up, those countries are happy because uh, they are able to buy uh, more goods coming from uh, uh, the rest of the world. But uh, uh, what is the right price of that? We cannot say that uh, there is a just price or, uh, or an unjust price. Those commodities in general, this is true for mineral commodities, do not cost very much to be, to be extracted. You have a huge uh, investment to make, but when the investment has been made, the marginal cost of extracting more oil, more copper is very low. So what is a fair price? Uh, if we want to think about in those terms, we would have to say, what is the fair distribution of total income in the world? This is a very difficult uh, question because when we talk about fair distribution, fair price, we have in mind a normative judgment. What does it mean fair? Some people will tell you, because the market is generating that price, it is fair because uh, people who demand that product are willing to pay so much, people who sell this product are willing to be paid so much, and there is a price that equilibrates supply and demand, so this is fair. But you might say, no, no, it is not fair because those suppliers are poor people and uh, we should try to give them more. But this is uh, a, a normative judgment and the uh, Economics is uh, not only normative. What do you think in general is the biggest challenge we are facing at the moment? I believe that uh, the biggest challenge that uh, is in front of us is how will it be possible to employ all everybody in the world? How will, it, how will it be possible to provide to everybody not so much the income that they need, not so much the food that they need, I believe that we'll be able to do that, but to provide them the job that they would like to have. And uh, uh, it will be difficult to provide jobs to this uh, 
very large number of uh, young Africans, which will, will arrive on the labor market in uh, the coming years, it will be very difficult to prevent many people in advanced economies to lose their job. In, already in the case of China, it is already the case that the manufacturing sector is not hiring people anymore. And they do, they do the opposite. They are already uh, laying off <coughs> workers because they are using automated uh, uh, um, uh, production processes. So I would say that the big issue in uh, the coming uh, 20 years will be essentially jobs. Do you support the idea of a basic income? Because we will be going through difficult times, we should make sure that we are able to provide to everybody the income that they need in order to survive in a satisfactory way. Not to live in luxury, but in a satisfactory way. To have enough to eat, to have enough to pay for a roof on their heads, to, pay, uh, to have enough to buy clothes, etc. But my point, and uh, I believe this is possible. I mean, this is a big effort. It is a big redistribution. We need to go much beyond what we do today. But I believe this is possible. At least economically, it is possible. More difficult is that for people, this is not enough. If I'm told, be satisfied, you have the income to uh, live on, but uh, you don't have a job, you should be happy. You don't have to work and uh, you have some income. I will not be happy. Because this means that uh, I don't have a function in the society. I'm not included in the society. Part of uh, the way of life that we have built, not only in uh, advanced countries, but everywhere in the world, we are in a society where labor work as a value, not a moral value, as a value as a social value, because this is the way in which we socialize. And uh, because of that, I would say that uh, the basic income might be done. It will be much more difficult to make sure that everybody will be included in the society. If you had a magic wand, what changes would you make tomorrow? Okay, what I will say is, uh, is a bit uh, probably... Uh, Uh, problematic and controversial. But if I had all the power, I would say uh, that I would like to control the technical change. I would like to tell people who are uh, working on autonomous cars, uh, on uh, new drugs, uh, tell, to tell them some of the work you do is fine, please continue when you have new drugs that will uh, cure some uh, pathologies. But uh, your autonomous cars and trucks, I don't care about them. Let's continue with uh, uh, human-driven uh, cars because you will be getting rid of too many, uh, too many jobs. And uh, we don't know what to do with, uh, with those people who will be out of a job. But you cannot stop progress. I mean, the technical progress will go on. If it is possible to do better, uh, uh, to invent a new uh, mechanism that will uh, uh, do incredible things, and it is true that we are doing incredible things, then it is very difficult to go, to go against that. So, uh, uh, this is not possible. But then, what we could possibly do is uh, uh, to try to maintain a demand for uh, jobs Uh, which is uh, at a reasonable level. For example, my, uh, I have a, a, a former colleague and a very good friend, and uh, we wrote many uh, papers uh, and books uh, together, uh, who uh, died uh, two years ago. His name is uh, Tony Atkinson, and he's one of the uh, most important economists, having worked on inequality. And uh, uh, his last book... Uh, which was uh, called Inequality, What Can We Do? Uh, he had a very, very interesting idea. He was saying, first, the state in a country should be a kind of employer of last resort. Saying, now some jobs are missing, then the state must be 
providing those jobs which are missing. So what would people do? And then uh, one of his uh, suggestions to say, we want to get rid of the automatic uh, mechanical uh, relationship between the administration and the people. Today, you call uh, any kind of uh, public service, you don't have a human, a human voice in front of you. You have more and more a, uh, a machine uh, voice, which tells you uh, press one, press two, press three, etc. You, 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 it takes hours, you don't get exactly what you want. And uh, his point was to say, let's uh, have a, a principle which says that when you call the administration, you must have on the other side somebody, a human. And uh, I thought it was a very nice image at the same time of the risk that we have in front of us and uh, of uh, how good the world will be if indeed we were uh, having this kind of human relationship. What is the most important lesson you have learned in life? And if you could talk to your teenage self, what would you tell him? Okay, I guess that, uh, okay, I'm not prepared to answer that question, so I have no time to think about it. But the first uh, reaction which comes to my mind was to say that uh, when I was uh, young, younger, maybe not 15 years old, but uh, maybe a little later, I saw that uh, the world, a country, was an organized uh, system and that it was possible to have uh, somebody uh, or various people in charge of the system and uh, driving the system in a very uh, definite uh, direction uh, with very uh, clear principles. And uh, uh, this is a way in which uh, the, the world would be uh, progressing uh, over time. And uh, what uh, strikes me today is the fact, I mean, not already for quite some time, is the fact that uh, uh, to uh, use a very uh, well-known expression, uh, there is no uh, pilot in the plane. And uh, basically, we are in a world which is uh, going in a, in a kind of haphazard uh, direction. Uh, we don't know what really may happen. Uh, we know that there are huge, uh, uh, huge uh, problems in front of us. We talked about inequality. We talked about uh, uh, politics. We didn't talk about the environment. We didn't talk about climate change. This is an incredible uh, threat, which really is a threat for the whole humankind. What is going on? We are absolutely unable to organize ourselves to take action against that. And this is really what, uh, at the same time, bothers me most and uh, uh, makes me believe that uh, uh, my generation, because I'm uh, really at the end of, uh, of uh, my career, didn't do well to some extent. We missed. We missed something. Uh, what exactly did we miss? I don't know. Uh, we understand that uh, the reason why we're not able to act is because... Uh, uh, there are uh, lobbies, uh, there are people who have more power than others, uh, who would be uh, affected negatively by some uh, uh, environmental policy, uh, but uh, we have not been able to put any order in, in this. And, uh, okay, this is my, my regret. And uh, what, I, what I learned is that is, the world is a, uh, is a kind of... Uh, a society which progresses in a, in a kind of random way. What kind of society do you dream of? Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm dreaming of a society where uh, people would be uh, able to do uh, what they want. Uh, and uh, to some extent, I think that I spend my life uh, trying to uh, think about this and uh, to, uh, to reflect on the way this can be done. Uh, but this is, of course, a, a complete dream. But uh, it is at the same time a dream and it is an ideal. And uh, uh, 
uh, from that point of view, I like very much uh, the kind of uh, definition of uh, of freedom that uh, uh, is given by Amartya Sen. Uh, when Sen, uh, Sen has this fantastic book, uh, the title of which is Development as Freedom. And his point is to say development is not about producing more and more and more. It is not about GDP growing at uh, 5, 6, 10%. His development is to provide people with the possibility of doing what they want to do. And I think this is a great uh, way of looking at the world. This may be a dream. Maybe at the end we'll be able to reach that uh, stage. I don't know. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you so much for sharing. Next time. We are going to continue with our mini-series about inequalities. I hope to see you soon again. Bye and ciao.